Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. Jesus will gather together his elect from all nations, every corner of the globe, Matthew 24, 31. Jesus will carefully and creatively place every living stone in the edifice of the living church, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. From gladiator arenas in ancient Rome to prison cells in communist Russia, Christians have long faced persecution. And it's not just a part of history. Even today, our brothers and sisters around the world risk their safety and even their lives for the sake of following Christ. But through it all, God has promised to build His church. And that's our subject today on Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy. It's the powerful conclusion of a brand new series called Be Encouraged. Let's dive in. So let's come and look at our text. There's three things here I want us to see in Matthew 16, verses 18 to 20. Let me just put the text in its context very briefly. Here we have a wonderful confession from Peter concerning Christ. It all begins in verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples. So bear that in mind. When Peter speaks, he's not speaking for himself. He's speaking on behalf of the apostles. Peter's the spokesman for the twelve. The original question is addressed to the twelve. Who do men say that I am the Son of Man? And Peter, on behalf of the disciples, give the answer. Well, you know what? Some people say you're John the Baptist. Remember, that was Herod's idea. John the Baptist came back to life. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah was persecuted. You've been persecuted. Other prophets are mentioned too. But Peter says, no, they're wrong. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Poles are always wrong when it comes to the true identity of Jesus Christ. So the point is this. Peter's response to Jesus' question leads to Jesus' response to Peter's answer. Well, then on that rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm going to say three things concerning the church. It's developed on a great truth. It's destined to a great triumph and it's defined by a great task. Let's just look at these quickly. Developed on a great truth. And that is the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And by extension, that means that the church is built upon Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So the context is Jesus. The context is Christ and his messianic credentials. This passage is showing, no, he's not a prophet. He's not John the Baptist. He's not Elijah. He's not Jeremiah. No, he's the one the prophets spoke of. Any interpretation of this text, which takes the focus off the focus of the text, in its context, is surely to miss the point of the text. So if you read this text in its context, verse 13, who do men say that I am focuses on Jesus? Scroll down to verse 16, you are the Christ of the living God, focus on Jesus. Scroll down to verse 20, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Christ, Jesus, focus on Jesus. The focus is on Jesus. And so when you come to look at this rock, It's Jesus, because that's the focus of the text. That's the intent of the author. That's how they would have embraced the image of the rock. By the way, why didn't Jesus say, hey, you are Peter, and on you, I'll build my church? He could have. Jesus could have used a personal pronoun, you. He didn't. He used a demonstrative pronoun, this. Why the confusion? Why didn't he just clear up the ambiguity? If Jesus wanted us to know that Peter is now about to take on a special role that the Catholic Church argues now morphs into the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome and the Pope's throughout history who exercised jurisdiction over the visible church, then he could have just said, hey, it's you, Peter. Hey, guys, it's Peter. But he didn't do that because that wasn't his intention. The reveal is Jesus, the Son of the living God, the foundation of the church that he is about to build. 
Because the building of the church was future to this moment. The church didn't exist up until this moment. The church has its birthday on the day of Pentecost. That's a whole different issue. The church did not replace Israel. The church was future. Okay, so that's the church developed on a great truth. And the great truth is that Jesus is her foundation. That ecclesiology is Christology. That the church is the body of Christ and Christ alone is head. The church is under His jurisdiction. He's the foundation, vitality and hope. Not popes, not pastors, not programs, not politicians, but the person and power of Jesus Christ. That's the church's hope. Let's move on. Developed on a great truth. Destined to a great triumph. Destined to a great triumph. Look at our text. I will build my church on this rock, me, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Since the church is built on the divinity, eternality, immutability, and omnipotence of Christ, there's an indestructible character and quality to her. Churches die of starvation and strangulation and suffocation. But the church will never die. The church will never be conquered by death. And the church will continue to grow. Because Jesus is committed and it's no idle dream. I will build my church, that's for sure. We've gone from 120 in an upper room in the city of Jerusalem to a worldwide phenomena that's turning the world upside down. And you know what? When you read Philippians chapter 1, even some in Caesar's household are being saved. Man, the church is like a prairie fire. You can't stop it. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. And despite political powers, despite persecution, despite lack of resources, the church grew and kept growing in the book of Acts. 3,000, 5,000, and the disciples were multiplied and the word of God grew. I love this statement by Theodore Beza, a wonderful man of God. And he said to King Henry of Navarre, Sir, sire, it belongs to the church of God in the name of whom I speak to receive blows and not to give them, but it will please your majesty to remember that the church is an anvil which has worn out many a hammer. Read biography, please. Read church history. It'll do you good. Read the martyrs' stories because the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Hammer blow after hammer blow and the anvil still stands. And the church is growing in some places ever so slowly in other places like wildfire. What a message. You need to embrace it. It'll shed a new light on anything you do around here. In changing diapers in the nursery, in slogging through a committee meeting, in teaching the Sunday school class. It'll put a spring in the step of our deacons and elders as we go to our next meeting. This pushes us forward into evangelism, right into a culture that seems increasingly to be uninterested. We are driven forward and we are defined by the idea that Jesus is building His church. It's just a sure thing. I want to get in on that. I can't believe that He's using me and you as part of that. Let's be wise master builders. Let's preach His gospel. Let's proclaim His Word. Let's show the change He makes in our lives. We're part of something of eternal significance. I don't know if you get that feeling on Monday morning, wherever you go to work. Probably not. But every time you come on this campus, any time you're part of the life and ministry of this church, you're part of something eternally significant. Your offering will be the best money you've ever spent. Your acts of service here will echo out into eternity. You're part of something that's always winning and will win out. There will be ups and downs, ebb and flow in certain times and in certain places, but the reports of the church's death are always greatly exaggerated. Jesus is with her until the end of the age. The elect will be saved The living stones will be brought into the edifice. The church stands for something vital and the vitality of the ever-living Christ ensures her surviving, reviving, and thriving. At times throughout church history, the church has looked sick. 
maybe even seemed terminal. But like Jairus' daughter at the hands of Christ who raises people from the dead, the church will stand up from her deathbed in every generation and live another day. She'll always outlive her Paul bearers. Listen to um, actually Gerald Stanton in his book, The Myth of a Dying Church. This is a good quote. Christ's bride cannot not grow. The author is life. Its savior is life. Its life giver is life. Divine life moves only in one direction toward more abundant life. Death and decline are its exact opposite. Thus the church cannot be thwarted. Yes, local manifestations of it may grow complacent and get off track. Local churches can grow lax like the church at Laodicea mentioned in Revelation or even lifeless like the church at Sardis. The church may be lay wed by false teachers like the church in Pergamos. They may get seduced into sexual immorality like the churches in Corinth and Tyre. Tyre, They may become dominated by squabbling and pettiness, but the church itself cannot be hindered. It's true. I think I've told you this story before. In the old Ben-Hur movie, which is just a a treat to watch, if you haven't watched it, it, Charlton Heston's the the main actor is Ben-Hur. And if you remember the movie, there's this great chariot race. And if you get into the background of the movie itself, there's an interesting story that emerges where Charlton Heston had kind of been taught how to manage a team of horses and a chariot. But he wasn't that good at it. They give him some extra help with that. It said that one day he goes to the, the director, William Wyler, and he says this, quote, Mr. Wyler, I can barely stand and stay on this chariot. I can't win the race. Mr. Wyler looks at him and says, Charles, your job is to stay in the chariot. My job as the director is make sure you win. You stay in the race and I'll make sure you win. That's what Matthew 16, 18 is saying. Stay at church, help the church, serve the church, be the church. I'll make sure you win because I'm building my church and no one will kill off the church. Don't be a chicken little about the church. Okay, for five minutes, just the last thought. That's really the heart of what I wanted to get across. But the church is finally defined by a great task. It's developed on a great truth and it's destined to a great triumph, but it's defined by a great task. I'm not going to do this justice, but I, I'll try and give you the, the gist of verse 19 especially. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but But Jesus then goes on to say, And I will give you, speaking to Peter and the disciples, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, now this text gives rise to all kinds of jokes about Peter standing at the pearly gates. And you get there and all of that nonsense. Here's what I think it truly means. Keys speak of access, don't they? Just by nature, keys open and close things. Keys speak of access to and opportunities afforded for. And if you go to Luke 11, 52, you'll find Jesus castigating the religious elites and establishment of his day for removing the key of knowledge so that people were prevented from entering the kingdom. He chastises them from taking away the key to the kingdom, knowledge about the kingdom. So it's believed by a majority of Protestant commentators that what we're dealing with here in the image of the key is access to the gospel. Peter has just confessed Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and upon the one whom he confessed, the church will be built. And the church is built through the determination of the word concerning the living Christ. And so given... That reality, connecting those dots, it's believed that what Jesus is saying to Peter and by implication the apostles, because Jesus never gives anywhere in the Gospels anything to Peter he doesn't give to the other apostles. And so what we're dealing with here is they can open the door into the kingdom through preaching about the door that is salvation itself, Jesus Christ. And the binding and the loosing probably ties in to the idea that when we preach in the authority of the risen Christ, His gospel, we can with authority say to those who embrace it, you're in. And we can say to those who don't embrace it, you're out. You're either saved or lost. In or out. We're loosing, we're binding through the preaching of the gospel. And I think that's a good interpretation for this text. 
In fact, Warren Wearsby says, Peter was given the privilege of opening the door of faith to the Jews at Pentecost, Acts 2, to the Samaritans, Acts 8, and to the Gentiles, Acts 10. Now, Peter reached Gentiles in the land of Israel. Paul comes along as the apostle to the Gentiles, and he takes the keys, and he opens the door of faith to the Gentiles outside of Israel, Acts 14, 27. But constantly, as the disciples go out into the world and preach the gospel, doors are opened, and people come into the kingdom through the preaching of the gospel, as they accept it or reject it. So as we close, I could say it more, and I should say more, but I can't. I think the point, if I've interpreted this right, and I hope I have, is basically this. Now that the apostles are gone and we remain, this text is reminding them and by extension us that it's the function of the church that Jesus is building to make the gospel accessible. That's your function. That's why you and I exist. That's why the church is being built across the world to make the gospel accessible. To be like the Thessalonians, we read of them. Paul says, I want to commend you guys. From from among you was echoed out, reverberated out the word of God and your faith is being spoken everywhere. The church exists by mission as fire exists by burning. Let a fire go out and it turns to ashes. If we don't evangelize, we fossilize. The church grows under Christ through the preaching of the gospel and the embracing of that gospel as people join the church. We must not only keep the faith, we must share the faith. My friends, we are fishers of men, not keepers of an aquarium. You know what? We try to serve you here. We try to make paths easy. We try to make it a creative environment for your family, and that's all good. But if that becomes inbred, and it's us four and no more. We're headed in the wrong direction. We meet under the head to love Him, sit under His Word, draw strength from Him through His Word that we might scatter and make the gospel accessible. That's why we're here in North Orange County. I just wrote a few things down for you to think through as we wrap this up and the team comes up. How can you make the gospel more accessible? Number one, reach someone from another country in your country. Think about the book of Acts and the day of Pentecost. Many people from other countries come into their country. Peter reaches them with the gospel and they go back to their country and spread the gospel. You want to give people access to the gospel as broadly as possible? Here's one of the ways to do it. Reach someone from another country in your country. Number two, pray for open doors into closed countries. Number three, support the work of Bible societies and Bible seminaries. Number four, invest in Christian proclamation media. Think about where technology can take the gospel. And when you travel, by the way, if you're a businessman that travels across the world, or even as a family, someday you travel to another country, travel as an ambassador for Jesus Christ, making the gospel accessible. It's not a week off. It's not a week off. It's a wonderful opportunity to bring the gospel and access to the gospel closer to people. And then through the local church, partner with missionaries all across the world. There's more we could say, but you get keep thinking, how do I make the gospel accessible to people? Because that's our job. I'm reading, haven't finished it. I'm enjoying it. The life of R.C. Sproul. Wonderful, wonderful servant of God. Presbyterian, reformed, established Ligonier. Got to meet him in person one day. And actually, I think it was in Toledo, Ohio. And he stumped me over lunch. I happened to stop by his table and learning I was from Northern Ireland. He said, Philip, you know what Irish confetti is? My God, I have no idea, Dr. Sproul. He said, bricks. <laughs> bricks. <laughs> He's just a character, godly man, and a great apologist and philosopher for the gospel and the Christian worldview. Early on in his salvation, he comes to this conviction. I owe every human being I know to do everything I can to communicate the gospel to them. I owe every human being I know to do everything I can to communicate the gospel to them. Of course he's right. That's why the church exists, to make the gospel accessible. It's built to last. This church, alongside the church, why the future is looking good. 
The prospects are, are very positive. We've got a head that's living, powerful, sits on the throne of heaven, who has given us the strength of the Holy Spirit and the precious treasure of the gospel to go out into the world and make it accessible so that people come through the door, which is Jesus Christ, into the kingdom and into the joy of a relationship with God. And that's happening in greater numbers. It is happening. It will happen. It will never stop happening. You can't give yourself to something greater than the church because there's nothing greater than the church. I think it was Eric Alexander says something like this. When the scaffolding of world history is taken down, what will remain is the edifice of the church. And God will point to it and say, that's my masterpiece. Treasure the church. Be active in the church. Be a good ambassador for the church. Father, we thank you for our time in the Word this morning. What a text. What a place to anchor our theology of the church and think about what we ought to be and what we ought to be doing despite what's happening around us. Help us not to become chicken littles. Help us not become purveyors of fear that the best years are behind us. Help us to be bullish about the future of the church. Help us to trust in your sovereignty. Help us to draw from your power. Help us to read passages like this and read the book of Acts and read church history and realize that the church has always outlived its pallbearers, that the church is one stubborn anvil that has worn out many a hammer. Oh God, I pray that this church will exist in vibrancy until Jesus comes. Help us in this generation to secure that reality by our authenticity, by our giving, by our coming, by our serving, by our evangelism out into the community. Lord, we live as members of this church for people who are not yet members of this church, but you're going to save and bring here to be members of this church one more living stone into the living edifice. How exciting. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Such a powerful conclusion to our series called Be Encouraged from Philip DeCourcy on Know the Truth. Whether you're new to Know the Truth or are a longtime listener, we're delighted you joined us today. And if it's your very first time listening, we'd love to welcome you with a booklet from Philip DeCourcy. It's called Seven Days of Truth, Resting in God's Providence. Visit ktt.org to request your copy. We love being able to provide resources from booklets to the daily broadcast free of charge. And we're so grateful for all of you who stand with us financially to make this program possible. As you've been strengthened and equipped through Know the Truth, will you link arms with us by donating? Your gifts are a blessing to your fellow listeners, ensuring these messages can go far and wide, reaching a world that's hungry for truth. To show our gratitude for your support, we've selected an encouraging devotional-style book we'd like to send you called Pathways to Peace, Facing the Future with Faith. This book will help you dive even deeper into Isaiah 40, our passage for today, and one that has encouraged believers down through the ages. You'll learn what it means to renew your strength as you wait on the Lord. Request a copy when you donate today by calling 888-644-8811 or go to ktt.org and look for the book titled Pathways to Peace. Finally, if you don't yet follow us on social media, we'd love to connect with you. You'll receive daily quotes, Bible verses, and inspiration. Plus, you can interact with your fellow listeners. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for Know the Truth, or if it's easier, You'll find all the links at ktt.org. I'm your host, Wayne Shepherd, inviting you to join us next time when we'll continue finding encouragement from God's Word right here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Mm-hmm.